Hello, and welcome to a discussion on the macro economy as well as international fixed income. My name is Chris Stegeman, and today I'm joined by portfolio managers Bill Campbell and Luce Padilla. Bill and Luce, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks Chris. for having us. Luce is the head of international fixed income here at Double Line Capital. Luce was named one of the 100 most influential women in U.S. finance by Barron's and one of the top 10 women in asset management by Money Management Executive. Bill Campbell is a portfolio manager on the Double Line Global Bond and Local Currency Emerging Market Strategies. So today we're going to go around the world to discuss the macroeconomic environment and investment landscape. Uh, and Bill, you mentioned China. Just last night, there was an announcement of, of a stimulus uh, package and, and increasing the budget deficit ratio to, I believe, 3.8%. It seems like over the course of this year, the market's been waiting for a bazooka of stimulus of some sort, uh, which hasn't really come to fruition. Curious your thoughts on this most recent announcement and uh, where you stand right now in terms of them potentially or not uh, reaching that 5% GDP target. Sure. Well, I'll start with the last point first. I think the fact that we're seeing a targeted fiscal stimulus come out uh, after President Xi met with the standing committee last night, increasing the fiscal budget by 0.8% from 3 to 3.8%, I think it pretty much guarantees that the year-end GDP print is going to be at 5%, if not uh, just below. Uh, the big surprise was the Q3 GDP print that just came out. Uh, it came out above expectations at 4.9%, so it's right in line. And when we look at what was actually happening underneath the hood, we see that the consumer remains strong with retail sales surprising to the upside. On the industrial side, there was continued strength with industrial production tracking at 4.5% year over year. So. The stimulus measures that had been dripping out over the past couple of quarters already were starting to impact the Chinese economy leading up to last night. But now that Xi has stepped in, in a command and control economy where they are increasing the fiscal stimulus, uh, I think that the left tail or the concern that there's going to be a downside growth shock has been significantly reduced, at least in the near term. Now, one of the things that they didn't address in uh, last night's announcement is how they are going to longer term work out the issues of an over indebted uh, property sector and an over indebted local government sector. Uh, Xi, in an unprecedented move, crossed the street after the MPC meeting and went and met with the PBOC, China's central bank and had a discussion with the PBOC governor and other officials about how to shore up economic stability and financial stability. Now, obviously that is targeting how they are going to work out the issues of over-indebtedness in those sectors. But when you look at the stimulus that came out of the state council or the standing committee, it's actually infrastructure-based. They're gonna be focusing on, thing, on a lot of uh, public works projects uh, from new roads, uh, new water facilities, uh, you know, more electrical facilities. So the infrastructure that's coming out is now what we would term old style infrastructure. It's what we'd seen in the past. It's going to be net supportive of growth, net supportive of commodities, but and it's going to lead to a cyclical upswing. What I mean by that is a couple of quarters of improved GDP. The problem is the structural, the longer term growth. And the longer term growth is still suffering from over indebtedness and lack of a new growth model. The fact that they had to go back to this old style investment led stimulus that comes by investing in infrastructure really raises questions as to what that long term uh, growth rate for the Chinese economy is. So we're still sticking to the uh, scenario where we think you do get this uh, near term pickup and levitation. But longer term, you're probably moving to a lower glide path, probably closer to 3%. So to answer your question specifically, I think 5% is now pretty much uh, locked in, barring uh, a big surprise. Maybe it's a geo geopolitical surprise, but barring a surprise, that's probably locked in. And then we'll have a few more quarters of decent growth, uh, which should be net supportive to emerging markets 
across the board, especially Latin America is, you know, losing, uh, I know we do a lot of uh, work at the links that China has with Latin America. So that should be net supportive to other emerging markets uh, in the coming quarters as well. The longer term still remains a question in our eyes. Yeah. Now, given the size of China, you know, China is, of course, different than 20, 25 years ago. Is 3% as a long-term GDP growth rate enough to buoy emerging market growth, given it's the second largest economy? So it's an interesting question. Uh, I think that it's... Uh, the, the IMF just came out with uh, their latest update to the world economic outlook. And one of the things that uh, kind of jumped out in kind of the first order, uh, things that jumped out from... Uh, that report is, although the headline global GDP is expected, uh, you know, only to moderate, uh, you know, by a tenth of a basis point or so uh, between, uh, you know, this year and next year and was only revised down very slightly, the intra-country dispersion uh, was very large. We saw bigger downgrades uh, across some developed markets and emerging markets than we saw an upgrade to the United States. Uh, so what we ended up, uh, you know, seeing is despite the, you know, surface looking like we have fairly calm waters, underneath the surface, there are all these cross currents uh, that are picking up. And I think this leads to your question. China, I think the world has realized that they had an over-reliance on China for cheap goods and cheap labor and also uh, security reasons have caused a lot of countries around the globe to decide to reshore or move around their supply chains. So that's going to be something that needs to be worked through over the next uh, you know, few years. With a 3% growth rate, yes, as an economy starts maturing, the, the speed at which the economy can grow goes down. That being said, when we look at the GDP per capita in China, it's only about 12 and a half, which is very low. It's a middle income, lower middle income standards. But then, uh, you know, the advanced Asian counterparts are closer to 30, 35,000 when we're starting per person, when we start looking at South Korea and Singapore and Japan. So the, the question in my mind is, uh, to see China really have that support go out to the rest of the world, they need to find a new growth model. Can they get a technological advance? Can they move beyond just a cheap labor and investment-led uh, you know, growth model into something more? Uh, so if they can't, I think China does remain net supportive to the commodity exporters. But as we watch China and see how they can develop and see if they can really lift themselves out of the middle-income trap, the question is, we need to see how they do it to then define who the winners will be that we can tag along with. And it's not clear yet what direction that's gonna take. Understood, thank you, Bill. So again, uh, switching gears to loose, Bill, you mentioned uh, the linkages between China and Latin America. Latin Amer America, of course, generally tied to the commodity market more so than other regions. Right now, when you look at LATAM, Luce, where are the opportunities that you and your team are taking advantage of? Within Latin America, you know, certainly the larger countries, uh, Brazil, Mexico, are two of our favorites. Um, we have some exposure in Chile, um, Colombia. So those I would say, uh, and Peru, th those would be like the top five. Um, then there's some others, you know, where we opportunistically uh, will put on positions. But I think um, that really has been our strategy for a while is really to focus on some of the larger countries that have the potential to continue to migrate up the credit curve and improve their overall uh, conditions. Um, and then not just look at the sovereigns, but also look at the corporate sectors. Um, and you know, it opens up the opportunity set um, within those countries because you can buy anything from investment grade credits even while the country may not be investment grade, all the way down to you know high yield single B or sometimes distressed credits. So there's there's a, a, a wider opportunity set. I think that the corporate sector um, provides within those countries to be able to sidestep maybe some of these uh, situations that are occurring, you know, in Russia and Ukraine, as well as uh, well currently in Israel. So um, and and the broader region. So within 
um, you know, Latin America, and I would say within all the regions, you know, we continue to favor the sectors that are uh, strategic to an economy. So the banking sector, for example, is one of uh, currently one of our, our um, largest exposures, and we continue um, to have and an add to, to that particular sector. But then we also, as you know, we also like utilities, um, the telecom sector, natural resources, so oil and gas and mining. So those would be the larger um uh, positionings uh, within not just Latin America, but really, uh, you know, across um, the whole globe. Yeah. So would you say across the board, generally running an underweight to Argentina and kind of steering clear, at least as of now, from... Um, yes, that is correct. Um, it's, you know, again, uh, although I would say that the corporate sector has actually, by and large, um, done better than the sovereign sector um, within Argentina. And part of that really is because um, you have a local base of investors that has very little place to go to buy dollar denominated assets. So they've actually been bidding um, a lot of, of the dollar denominated bonds that are outstanding. So that's held up the pricing um, within that particular country. A lot to unfold when it comes to emerging market fixed income investing, particularly on the rates and currency side. So, Bill, specific to, let's say, local currency, EMs type strategies, can also throw in global bond strategies in there. What are some areas that you're either avoiding or favoring relative to your index? So, uh, I think if you're looking at it, our current framework, what we're trying to do is we're trying to find the countries that have uh, decently credible policy, where we're being compensated for the risks that we're taking, mainly looking for high real yields in this environment, and that uh, generally is a function of uh, policymakers having got in front of the inflation cycle that now is uh, starting to dip down and countries that are showing decent amount of uh, growth or you know fairly robust growth. And uh, no surprise, uh, we're positioned fairly similarly uh, to what Luz is doing on the external side. Uh, we're favoring overweights in uh, Mexico and Brazil. Uh, maybe starting with Brazil, uh, growth has been you know, surprising net to the upside. Uh, that yes, there has been a decent amount of fiscal support now that Lula's come in, but uh, the central bank has engaged in extremely credible policy. They you know hiked aggressively, had uh, some of the highest uh, central bank rates on the planet, and then uh, when Lula came into office, there was a concern that the central bank's inflation anchor, their inflation target would be adjusted, which would have hurt the central bank's credibility. That was actually taken off the table and uh, the central bank policy credibility was maintained. And what that has allowed is it's allowed Brazil's central bank to start cutting rates uh, in the face of, uh, uh, with decently strong growth. And it, it creates a just a, a near term, very good uh, investment uh, climate. You have uh, nominal yields uh, in double digits, uh, nominal yields well above the rate of uh, inflation, although inflation is starting to tick up. The one thing that we are keeping uh, a close eye on right now is uh, we are concerned that the fiscal outlook, given Lula's history, and uh, as we're reading the tea leaves, we're very close to the situation, uh, moving into next year, they, the government is claiming that they are going to do some fiscal consolidation, try to target uh, a primary, like a flat primary deficit. The problem is they need to raise revenues to do that. And the problem with that is they really haven't passed any measures that are, have meaningfully moved the needle in that direction. So that does remain a risk on the horizon, but uh, with the currency kind of in the middle of the range it's been in the last two years and rates in double digits, it looks very attractive to us uh, in the near term to, t to both uh, pick up uh, some carry and with decent growth, maybe to pick up some extra capital appreciation on the currency side. Mexico, we have a very uh, similar story. We have very high uh, nominal yields compensating us for uh, you know, inflation that is coming back uh, you know, down. Uh, towards target, but uh, the central bank has actually uh, been extremely prudent, uh, holding back from any interest rate cuts. Growth has been net supported both by uh, some fiscal expansion 
uh, but also uh, by a stronger U.S. economy and by the nearshoring that we were talking about in China's case. Uh, again, U.S. Uh, companies are looking to bring their suppliers closer to home, and that's helped support the investment-led uh, gr growth uh, that we're seeing uh, in Mexico. So with the currency now dollar uh, Mex above uh, 18, we think that it's looking like an attractive value. And uh, with all-in yields in double digits, again, uh, these are the type of profiles, uh, both economically and uh, you know, from the rates and currency side that we're looking for uh, to kind of position us to be able to weather this volatility that, you know, a very questionable macro environment uh, that, that we find ourselves in today. That's great. I, I think uh, we should also touch a little bit, and you did with yields. We all know the yield story, all in yields more than double what they were, say, the end of 2020 and even 2021. So it is a murky macro backdrop as we go into next year, but I would think that all in yield should help cushion even if spreads were to widen. So I guess this question I'll direct your way, Luz, from a valuation standpoint when you're looking at the EM universe, really in particular using the JP Morgan MB Global Diversified as that kind of sovereign bogey. Last I saw, spreads were at about 450. So given, again, we'll just start on valuations, then maybe we can touch on technicals, but where do you put the asset class in general? Do you favor corporates or sovereigns at that 450 level? And I believe corporates were right around 350 using the SEMB Broad Diversified. Yeah, um, when I look at this, the let's say the history of, of spreads for our index, 450, um, I guess it's right on average. If you look at the full sort of history of the asset class going back to the 90s, um, it seems to be in line, you know, with um, sort of where we are in terms of the, the current um, economic backdrop. So I think for me, the asset class at 450 looks about right. Um, I think if when you pair that with you know, with treasuries and you look at all in yields of nine and a half, then you know that starts to paint like a different picture relative to what you can get in other asset classes. So I think if you can get double digits in this asset class that at the end of the day, it's still, let's say split rated investment grade, uh, high double B, it seems like a relatively attractive proposition. Um, if, you know, but if you want to wait, you know, another 50 basis points until you get to the 10, 10 and a half range, that seems reasonable to me because then, you know, you have more potential for, for capital appreciation. Um, and then potential also to cushion your, um, your return in case we have, you know, interest rates continue to go up. Um, so for me, I look at where we are, that spreads look relatively fair at, at, you know, this mid 400 range. Um, but I do think it is time to start looking or thinking about dipping your toe into into these waters, um, especially if we see spreads go, you know, above 500. I would say that's about, you know, the um, the the right level. Um, again, if you do a historical analysis of of spreads and yields, you know, you you will see instances and periods in which you'll see spikes above double digits, but we don't really tend to stay there that long, you know. Um, either because of spread compression, um, which you know we, we actually do see that potential. And then again, also when you compare the asset class to where you, um, to what you're being compensated relative to other asset classes, such as you know, US um, uh, high yield or investment grade, you know, there is a significant um, spread pickup relative to comparably rated um, credits within those markets. So I, I do think that, you know, um, again, spreads currently fair, but I do think it is time to, to start thinking about, you know, what, um, the compensation that you're receiving uh, within this asset class. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And we, we all know that spreads, when things move, it can move quickly, especially in a tightening phase. So if we do get through, whether it's a soft landing, hard landing, uh, once we do get through, uh, it, it can be sometimes too late uh, if folks wait to invest in Looking at almost 10% on a yield of maturity for a portfolio that's, let's say, 55% investment grade, 45% high yield, um, and diversification benefits like we spoke about. You tap into different election cycles, different generators of revenue, uh, whether it's in the commodity market or elsewhere. For an overall portfolio, 
uh, certainly we believe uh, emerging market fixed income uh, may, may be worth taking a look at if one doesn't already own it. Uh, Bill, I think we'd be remiss not to talk about Japan just a little bit on the, uh, on the macro side of things. So the, the yen dollar cross, a lot of talk about it going above 150 intraday, I believe yesterday. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about the BOJ uh, and potential intervention with the yen and then tie that back to what does it matter for, for an investor uh, on the global side of things? Sure. I think Japan is at a pretty interesting part, a, a pretty interesting period of its uh, uh, economic, uh, uh, kind of where it is in its economic cycle. Um, the Bank of Japan has uh, been is really one of the last uh, banks that's on uh, what is considered uh, ultra easy monetary policy. That being said, I think Governor Wada is being very coy with markets. He ever since he came in and uh, took over the top job at the BOJ after uh, Governor Kuroda. Uh, everyone thought that he would be uh, similar to Kuroda in his uh, communication style and his management style. Kuroda loved to surprise markets, loved to bring uh, big moves at uh, policy meetings that would catch the market by surprise. Weta has come out and uh, he's been very cagey in what he said, but if you look at the policy actions that have happened under him, he's released yield curve control. We're seeing 10-year JGB yields approach 1%. We have a meeting at the end of the month on Halloween, which is very fitting for, uh, for Governor Wade, I think. I believe that we probably will see that uh, band either further relaxed, maybe to 150, maybe released, or maybe he softens the language and just says, well, it's a rough target and lets the market float and see where, see where the equilibrium rates end up. I think what he's trying to do is affect the removal of this ultra easy monetary policy without telling the market about it, without causing excess volatility, without causing excess waves. Now, the, the, the negative externality to that is that everybody's been looking for this Corota style announcement to jump and, and jump on the yen as an obvious trade that uh, once the Bank of Japan starts moving and uh, tightening their policy with the rest of the world basically on hold, the yen has to appreciate. So that has been the macro trade that's frustrated uh, the global community uh, this year. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, after if if we get a release of the uh, upper end of the yield curve control target at the October meeting, if by year end or the beginning of next year, Q1 sometime, the negative interest rate policy is removed and uh, WADA moves the interest rate either back to flat, maybe up to uh, 10 basis points. And maybe that would uh, get the market uh, a little bit more in tune with what the Bank of Japan is doing, and you could get some currency appreciation on that. Now, because the currency hasn't appreciated and because there still is a very big divergence between the rest of what global central banks did over the past year and a half to two years, mainly tightening with the Bank of Japan not doing that, uh, the yen stands at one of the weakest levels that we've seen uh, in years at 150. The idea that a specific number is going to be targeted by the Ministry of Finance to tell the BOJ to intervene, I think is incorrect. I think what the Ministry of Finance wants to do is avoid one-sided depreciation in the yen. So if the yen starts depreciating while all other currencies are basically flat, then I could see an intervention at 155 or 153. If, on the other hand, uh, there is a further global weakening of currencies uh, against the dollar and the yen merely moves in line with its trading peers to 155, uh, I think it's a bigger question as to whether intervention uh, will actually happen. Now, the other interesting piece about what's happening uh, you know, with Japan vis-a-vis -vis the United States is when you look at uh, you know, hedging, the, if you were to buy a front-end JGB and hedge it out, 
you can pick up 6%. If you decide to go out and take a little bit more risk as an international, as a US-based investor, you can pick up maybe 7%, uh, depending on what point of the yield curve that you're, you know, that you're choosing to pick on the JGB curve. So there is a yield enhancement argument also uh, for owning Japanese government bonds and hedging them back uh, to, to, the, to the US dollar if you're a US-based investor. Um, and the, the final point that I would make is when you look at Japan's structural position, Japan is still a country of savers and the majority of that savings still sits externally to Japan. So if we do getting back to our original point, get a geopolitical flare up or, uh, another issue that surprises the market and causes, uh, volatility to pick up meaningfully there still is the ability for the Japanese yen to appreciate in a risk-off environment due to that, uh, the, that tendency of investors to bring their money back home if there is a big concern uh, uh, of a geopolitical or global volatility event. Yeah, yeah the age-old question is chase the winners or chase the losers, right? And the yen is the worst performing G10 currency uh, year to date, I believe, that still holds true. Uh, so positioning wise, would you say at this point, more or less neutral? We're pretty neutral. We're, I, I, what we're looking for is the market to catch up to what the BOJ is doing. If not, I, I like the hedging property to pick up additional yield. Uh, if we're in a continued carry environment where it's unclear, uh, that, you know, a recession is going to happen or, that we're back off to that we're back to a risk on environment, uh, picking up a six six and a half percent yield on a hedge JGB also looks interesting. So for those two reasons, we still like remaining neutral and think that Japan offers interesting opportunities in uh, a global bond portfolio. Understood. Thank you, Bill. Uh, definitely keeping everyone on their toes here. I, I teed up EM technicals and then uh, hit Bill with a, a question on Japan, but that's what keeps these conversations interesting. So, uh, Luce, we talked, I think maybe it was last week, where you were talking about how on the technical side from a net financing, it's actually pretty attractive right now for EM fixed income uh, on, on the corporate side. Could you just expand on that a little bit for us? Yeah, uh, thank you, Chris, for bringing that up. Um, yeah, I think as I was mentioning, it, it's it's interesting when we look at the flows, certainly, you know, um, when we look at flows for EM fixed income, we have seen outflows. So, you know, what does that mean for the countries and companies that need to be financed? Um, and when you look at what has been issued relative to, you know, what has been paid, um, so amortizations or maturities, and coupon payments, uh, what you start to see is you see a picture, especially within the corporate sector, where we've seen a, a shrinkage or a decrease in total debt stock. And that's because a lot of these companies have been able to find alternative sources of financing. Um, so one of the things I think, um, and one of the reasons why we liked or we gravitate towards, let's say the larger, more developed countries is because they tend to have deeper uh, local currency markets. And so what that means is that the companies then are able to issue within their local currency um, and they don't necessarily have to go to the inter international capital markets and or they can get loans sourced locally. Um, and then the third positive is that you typically t also tend to have um, a deep local base that is involved even in the dollar space. So, you know, it's a three, um, three pronged approach, if you will, that leads to a positive, a potential positive result for some of these companies. Um, and so going back to the overall shrinkage of the debt stock within EM corporates, we've seen the total debt stock decrease by about a hundred billion this year. And that does not include, um, the decrease that we saw due to the Russian um, war. Um, so we're, you know, we're not, we're not allowed to invest in Russia. So that total debt stock basically got removed from our index as well. So it's, it's been, um, I think from the technical perspective for corporates has been a net positive. And then also in sovereigns, it hasn't been, you know, as, as bad if you was, as one would have thought it also because again, a lot of these countries 
will come to the market, but they don't necessarily have to come to the um, international capital markets because they can tap their local banks, they can tap their um, you know local uh, bonds, and that's how they finance themselves. And so that's been a net, um, I would say, net positive as well. And then just lastly, I would say we haven't really seen that crossover investor that tends to lead to significant spread tightening come in, but um, they're also, so they're kind of the last in and the first out. Um, and so we haven't seen, <laughs> as a result, we haven't seen a very messy market where we've had, you know, a mass exodus. Um, so yes, we've seen outflows, but they've been, um, I think, relatively contained. Um, they, um, I think the reason why we haven't seen a very disruptive market is because of this overall de um, decrease in the debt stock of emerging market corporates. So, you know, um, investors have more money if they're in their pockets, if you will, because these companies are um, paying back their bonds early or, you know, they found alternative um, sources of financing. So they're not refinancing um, those bonds. Um, so net net, I think it, that's also that's been a positive. OK, great. Thank you, Luz. So attractive valuations, at least on a historical basis, at 450, uh, pretty supportive on the technical side. Clearly overhanging macro uncertainty as we head into 2024, uh, but therein lies the the valuations, uh, of course. So, well, thank you, Luce, and thank you, Bill. Thank you to everyone for joining us today for this macroeconomic and international fixed income discussion. If anyone has any questions on Double Line's international fixed income strategies feel free to email info at doubleline.com, or of course, you can contact your DoubleLine sales representative. Thank you and have a great day. <music>